David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It's Tuesday, May 21st, 2024. Time for another show. Time for some light construction outside during the show. Yesterday's uh, doorbell interruption wasn't, in fact, I don't know, who were we talking about at the time? I always love to make that joke. But uh, it was the, the folks next door alerting us that there would be a construction crew working outside uh, yesterday and indeed they did and today is just a noisier day so you know a little bit of power tools a little bit of knocking and pounding uh hopefully nothing serious no we won't hear any wilhelm screams of people falling off the roof or anything like that uh but you know just one of those things you have to live with when you don't have you know a whole fancy studio set up like, uh, well, I'm sure everyone would love to have that, except, uh, I don't know, silence is boring. And besides which, I like being interrupted by birds from time to time. Uh, my latest mania, my obsession lately has been I downloaded the Merlin bird identification app. Merlin, I, I think it's Merlin or Merlin ID. I'm not certain which. You'd think something I was so obsessed with would be uh, better known to me. It's Merlin Bird ID. That's the way it uh, identifies. On the front page, the very front page of my phone these days, I don't know what got me into Oh, yes, I do. I remember now what got me into it. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, just been enjoying, since the birds are always yelling at me, uh, one of the things, the application I've used it for here at home has been when the birds are audibly screeching outside the window, I have wondered, well, what is it that's making all that noise out there? And I think, didn't we find that it was a Carolina wren out there uh, disturbing the show one day? Anyway, it's gotten me interested in just uh, how many wild birds are routinely detectable by their voice anyway. Uh, in in the backyard area, and as it turns out, it's a whole hell of a lot. So it's really been kind of interesting cataloging these things. That doesn't really count as bird sightings because I rarely, if ever, actually see the birds making the noise. And the computer could be completely full of it, for all I know, and uh, is making up all sorts of nonsense about what's in the backyard. But it's quite uh, quite a chorus in the mornings and evenings, and I'm I'm waiting to see when I get to like fifty different species identified or fake identified anyway in my in my backyard or nearby environs so it's kind of a nice reminder that even in the uh in the suburbs there's quite a lot going on in the backyard and uh greg has this interest too he's got quite a bird feeder set up in the back he's watching the birds as they come in. He's actually, you know, interested in uh, the birds themselves as opposed to, I'm like, well, what the hell are these flying things in the backyard? What kinds of flying things are they? Uh, Although now I understand there's the hot new item out there is a bird feeder that has a, like a ring doorbell essentially in it and will film and photograph the birds that come and visit the feeder. So now I'll be able to see whether or not these, uh, loudmouth idiots are really here or whether my computer just thinks uh, the dishwasher going on is a, a new species of bird. Anyway, so I don't know. That's the excitement from around around town this morning. If you go to a different town, you might find different levels of excitement about different things. For instance, you might find, well, in this, the rest of this town, Washington, D.C., you might find people talking about, oh, I don't know, Donald Trump on social media circulating Nazi symbolism again. Except it's not, except it is. Uh, you know how this debate goes. It's a six-pointed uh, sheriff's star is what it is that we're using here. No, 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 that's not a sheriff's star. That's a six-pointed star of David, and come on now, sheriff stars. By the way, most sheriff stars are kind of oddly shaped. There are very few of them are six-pointed, though, as it turns out. Um, but at any rate, uh, today's, I don't know what you would call it, brouhaha about this stuff is the circulation of a, a video, you know, there's a certain amount of distance that the, they're trying to put between Trump and the thing. And uh, some of it you have to credit 
Okay. Uh, it's a fan video, essentially. And uh, he re... Whatever. Reposted it on Truth Social. So it's not entirely fair to say, well, the campaign put out this ad... But uh, they don't do very much in the way of vetting of these things. And it's not really such a great defense to say, well, we have so many Nazi fans that, uh, sure, eventually there's going to be Nazi references in their fan videos and we might miss them. That's not a great defense either. But even dumber, I guess. Uh, It was a reference, as it turns out, to uh, I guess the video comes around to saying, well, if Trump wins in 2024, here's. You know, like a sampling of some of the great headlines that you'll see, like the economy is booming and da 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 da. And I guess one of them is that Trump will bring about a unified Reich, which, meh, you know, all right, you're probably thinking, as most people did, third Reich, right? But but of course there was a first and a second, and they're actually sort of arguing out there. That I guess some of the text in the fake newspaper article appears to the pedantic eye to be referring to events around the time of World War One, not World War Two. Also, not a great defense. Well, it was another worldwide conflagration that killed millions that I'm referring to. That was the good one. All right. Well, that's no good either. So. Apparently, not necessarily a reference to the Third Reich, but, uh, you know, if you're defending which Reich you're glorifying, I think you're in the wrong place. If you're defending the Reich, you're losing. So uh, that seems like an odd thing to spend this much time over. But there you have it. And it just keeps happening, too. They just keep putting out fan videos, campaign videos, whatever, that have either Nazi imagery or... Harken back to Nazi rhetoric. And then, of course, the candidate himself runs around saying things like, immigrants are poisoning the blood of our country. And then a big march uh, by his supporters saying, Jews will not replace us. And gosh, it's hard to just avoid all of this and avoid this conclusion. So in, uh, in conclusion, I guess we can all be excited about voting for the uh, candidate one day when no one else is allowed on the ballot and only one candidate runs in the 2028 campaign, et cetera. You know, things like that. When you'll be forced to vote for the candidate who claims that, hey, it's just an ancient Hindu symbol for good luck. Don't worry about it. Uh, I don't know what the big deal is anyway. It's just a fun little design. What's the difference? Okay, so, you know, that's one of the stories that's circulating today. And gosh, that's, you know, seems like, fun. Uh, Also, of course, the trial continues for this particularly Nazi adjacent candidate in New York City. And I guess it's getting ready to wind up. The defense is up. The prosecution has rested its case. Uh, There was much more cross-examination of Michael Cohen recently. They scored some hits. They basically got, as I understand it, uh, 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 Cohen to admit that, well, one, that he can't stand Trump and that he might be interested in having a little bit of revenge and that he, uh, I I think, in the cross-examination, he admitted to having uh, stolen from the Trump organization somewhere along the line, which is, I don't even know if that's a crime necessarily. It might actually get you a promotion in the Trump organization. It's a weird group of people. Anyway, uh, the New York Times has put together in their Trump on trial vertical a uh, a piece here that they circulated in 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 email, which I don't know. I, I for some reason I don't have the link to it on their site, but I'll get it so I can share it with you. The email comes to me under the title of Trump on trial, the final stretch. That's something we definitely have to open up and take a look at. A high stress countdown begins. Writes. Uh, Well, that's the headline on the individual piece here uh, by Jesse McKinley. So let's read that by way of updates that we can figure out what's going on. There were some courtroom fireworks as well, not involving Michael Cohen that we need to catch up on. But it, it starts this way. For many Americans who fly their flags right side up ordinarily, the Memorial Day break, that's coming up, right? Oh, 
Gosh. Uh, which will mean barbecues, flag-draped parades, usually, again, right-side-up flags, and the glory of a three-day weekend. That's the real glory of all of this. Uh, let's uh, pay no mind to the fallen soldiers, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's a three-day weekend. But for those centrally involved in the criminal trial of Donald Trump, including the defendant, Donald Trump, the criminal defendant, it will be an anxious countdown to the culmination of the first trial of an American president. The prosecution rested today, and we don't mean they took a nap, though that's probably... <laughs> <laughs> the defendant rested today, too. Really? The defense rested without putting on a defense? No, no, I'm saying that the defendant took a nap during the proceedings. He just completely conked out. Anyway, the prosecution rested today after 15 days of testimony and 20 witnesses, including an intense four days on the stand for Michael Cohen. That is, of course, they helpfully remind us, Trump's former lawyer and fixer. What followed... Uh, or that was followed by a sharp confrontation between the judge, Juan Merchan, and a defense witness, Robert Costello, a lawyer who consulted with Cohen. Costello said he and Cohen spoke after the FBI raided Cohen's home in April of 2018 and that Cohen told him that Trump, quote, knew nothing about the payments to a porn star at the center of the case. In 2018, that was uh, still Michael Cohen's story, and he was sticking to it. He added that Cohen said, quote, that he did this on his own, and he repeated this numerous times. He was just reimbursed at an exorbitantly high rate for it and uh, had his taxes covered for some unknown reason. But Costello's testimony was overshadowed by his behavior, which included saying, geez, which... It's not by itself all that bad, but he said, geez, after an objection by prosecutors, one of many. He didn't really like it. He's a lawyer himself, and uh, he found there the prosecution's objections to, I don't know what, but the objections in general. He found the objections objectionable, but he's not there in his capacity as a lawyer. He's a witness, and he should essentially STFU unless asked a question directly. Merchan sent the jury away and then scolded Costello for not displaying proper decorum in the courtroom and giving him the side eye. I like that. Uh, I mean, I like the fact that he used the terminology. After a moment, Merchan then cleared reporters from the courtroom to continue to reprimand Costello. That's really something. A dramatic step that requires dramatic music, of course. <laughs> You don't really have to dance to that music. But dramatic step is not, you know, something you dance to dramatic music. It's a dramatic step that he took that put the defense on notice about controlling their witness, who is expected back tomorrow morning, by which we mean this morning, I guess, because tomorrow morning is Wednesday and there won't be any uh, witnesses being called tomorrow. Merchan's move put a tense cap on a gear grinding day in which stops and starts and scheduling dominated. The judge had already decided that closing arguments would not occur until next Tuesday, after Memorial Day. The jury is expected to be sent home for a long break tomorrow, Archon said, though that would be thrown out if Trump suddenly decided to testify in his own defense. That seems very unlikely. It would open him up to a variety of questions about his behavior, as well as previous cases that he has lost. So are they saying they'll take their normal break on Wednesday and then continue on into the long weekend? Or do they come back for Thursday and Friday proceedings and then have a long weekend after? It's kind of odd. How did they say this? Uh, the jury is expected to be sent home for a long break tomorrow. Yeah, okay. Uh, I guess the long break being Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Well, good for them. They get a little rest. Uh, closing arguments are coming soon. It notes here, Trump is charged, of course, with falsifying 34 business records related to the reimbursement of a $130,000 hush money payment by Cohen to Stormy Daniels, a porn star, just before the 2016 election. Cohen and Daniels are now tent poles of the prosecutor's case. I don't know if I would have gone there, but, uh, you know, I write so quickly. All right. Well, anyway... Daniels testified earlier this month saying she had a brief sexual encounter with Trump, very brief, in Lake Tahoe, Nevada in 2006. 
Cohen said he paid her off and then received a series of reimbursement checks from Trump, signed, many of them, by himself. That is to say, by Trump himself. Prosecutors will say the payment to Daniels was made to unduly influence the 2016 election. Those checks and other documents, including ledgers and invoices, may be even more critical than the star witnesses, both of whom faced grueling cross-examination. Would you say so? In which defense lawyers suggested they were liars out for financial gain, which is actually what was, you know, the sleeping guy over here is a liar out for financial gain. Late yesterday afternoon, Blanche, that is uh, Todd Blanche, Trump's attorney, implied that Cohen was so dishonest that Murchon should dismiss the case. But Murchon shot back saying, you said that his lies were irrefutable, but you think he's going to fool 12 New Yorkers into believing lies? All right. Still, that line of attack will likely be likely to suffuse the defense closings as well as several other themes. One is that the payoff of Daniels, as part of a non-disclosure agreement, was not an unusual move, though it's the false records from the reimbursement that are the basis of the state's case, not the agreement. Another defense assertion is that Trump was only acting to protect his family from salacious rumors, which, by the way, I've seen being written on recently. Let me see, I wonder if I could turn that up. Uh, but some, uh, some pedant or another uh, saying that salacious, while in wide use to describe the terms of the trial is not the right word uh, because of, I guess uh, if I recall the argument correctly, salacious was that there was something, you know, sexually interesting, attractive, satisfactory about it. Whereas the, the fact of a uh, big old orange Donald Trump having 10 seconds of sex with a, a porn star in a hotel room in Lake Tahoe is not really all that uh, super uh, engaging, let's say. It's an interesting story, but on a sexual level, uh, eh, not that really uh, that interesting or satisfying or, or attractive. And so maybe there's a different word that you want to use for it. But anyway, too late. They have said salacious about their rumors here. They may also say, the defense that is, that the payment to Cohen was not to cover up the payment to Daniels, but for legitimate legal work, something Cohen says isn't true and the rest of us know isn't even possible. For his part, Trump has denied the charges and having had sex with Daniels. He has continued to blast the case as politically motivated while forecasting a possible conviction in fundraising emails, including one yesterday in which he promoted a MAGA, a black MAGA hat to remember what could be one of the darkest days in American history. Yes, proper music for, for the darkest day in American history. Okay, sure. Trump has been in court now for six weeks, so he's really caught up on his sleep. Over the last week, he watched the warts and all grilling of Cohen, who admitted lying and theft from the Trump Organization, if Thursday's performance by Todd Blanche, Trump's lead attorney, was pure Perry Mason, you think so? Today was more Hercule Poirot, as he poked and prodded Cohen, looking for flaws in his narrative. That would have been yesterday's performance, not today's. He repeatedly attacked Cohen's credibility, including again mentioning an October 24th, 2016 phone call that he implied Cohen in which, I guess, he implied that li uh, Cohen had lied about on the stand. Oh, I see. Uh, a call that Cohen had lied about. Cohen says the call was to brief Trump about Daniels. Blanche, that it was about a series of prank phone calls Cohen had received. You have no doubt in your mind, Blanche asked. No doubt, Cohen replied. And then a final stab at Cohen. Blanche repeatedly attacked Cohen's motives, suggesting that Cohen was only in it for the money. Oh, no. An exchange that seemingly revealed a fascinating paradox. Trump's biggest enemies sometimes actually benefit from his success. Towards the end of it, well, like that explains the newspaper industry entirely. Toward the end of his cross-examination, Blanche asked if Cohen had a financial interest in the outcome of this case. Cohen said yes. He explained that Trump was the subject of his podcasts and his postings on TikTok. They make money, he said. Oh, damn it. Why does his make money? Uh, they make money, he said, before adding, 
Whether Mr. Trump is ultimately determined innocent or guilty is not going to affect whether I speak about it or not. He soon added that it would be better for him if Trump was acquitted because it gives me more to talk about in the future. Oh, no, I think uh, it's much better if he is convicted and we talk about that and then we get to deliver the news that uh, Trump, uh, I don't know what, uh, accidentally cut his fingers off in the wood shop in, in prison or something like that. Not that we would wish for such a thing. Uh, but it would have to be a very precise blade in order to make sure that it got the fingers. They're tiny. Anyway, the future could soon become clearer. Cohen walked off the stand at about 3.15 p.m. after some follow-ups from prosecutors meant to clean up some of the damage Blanche inflicted, if any, including the admission that Cohen had stolen $30,000 from the Trump Organization. Cohen admitted it was wrong. That is, it was wrong to do. It was correct that I stole it. It was wrong for me to do. But said... It was an angry reaction to having his bonus sharply cut. It was almost like self-help, he said. <laughs> he did help himself to the money. At one point, Blanche seemed disdainful when mentioning Cohen's ambitions, including a possible run for Congress, really, and a reality show called, naturally, The Fixer. He suggested those options arose from his fame or infamy in relation to Trump. Cohen responded somewhat philosophically, saying his name recognition came from the journey I've been on. My journey, he said, is to tell my story. Well, that's a little flaky, but okay. That's uh, that's the recap from the New York Times on all of this. By the way, one answer. It's, it's an interesting thing to, to say. Well, are, don't you stand to benefit financially from this case? Yeah. you. Well, I, ordinarily I would say that Todd Blanche also stands to benefit financially from the case, but his... His client is Donald Trump, so it's probably a little less likely than usual. But you're not allowed to answer like that, of course, in your uh, hostile uh, witness cross-examination. But at any rate, it's it's true, uh, not that the jury would be allowed to consider it formally, but uh, they might consider it informally if you happen to sneak that one in. Anyway, uh, let's see. The uh, my, my email inbox is the place where so much of this action is happening. Uh, let's see. I, I think I might have to... Uh, is there a way for me to keep this open without losing it? Yeah, maybe if I yeah, switch here. View in browser. And then I'll be able to give you a link for this article if you want to double-check my reading of it and make sure I got it all correct. All right. So Tuesday... We've got lots left over from previous days that we didn't get to. Uh, oh, yes. Yesterday, uh, oh, you know, maybe now is the time to, to start in on this. There's still more from the reading of the Texas Tribune story about the uh, woman who won a seat on the local school board as a, uh, let's say, MAGA adjacent, although she may in fact be MAGA in general, um, but uh, as a culture warrior, a Republican culture warrior who then arriving at work, essentially, began doing the job that she, you know, actually doing the job that she promised people she was going to do as a right wing reactionary, review the curriculum and root out all of that horrible bad stuff uh, that everybody was so afraid of and then found that none of it actually existed and said so and found that her fellow Republicans wanted nothing more for her to than to sh shut her up and go away. Uh, well, there is more to that story. Though our first break is coming up, we might as well try and uh, get through the rest of it because it was important. And then I had another story that I was holding for today and uh, it now being today, now would be the time to uh, share it perhaps. Extremism is the problem. That is... Well, not only true, but it is the title of the section up next in this story just before we left off in the Texas Tribune story yesterday. And uh, you'll recall that uh, this is the story of one Courtney Gore from the Granbury ISD, Independent School District, in Texas. And uh, as I recall, the uh, Granbury is not the, what is it, the town or is it, the, it's not the county. I, I, there's a mention 
uh, somewhere along the line of what county they're operating in in Texas, but as I and uh, the geographic location, but we've left that behind and read it once or twice. I think we reminded everybody of it yesterday, but now extremism is the problem. That is true. Let's hear why. A week after that post, which post was it? The post where she went to Facebook on June 8th and said, I refuse to be someone's puppet. I refuse to be told what to do, what to say or how to vote. I refuse to participate in any agenda that will dismantle or abolish public education. She was actually dedicated to good public education in Texas, which is a rare thing uh, among Republicans. So a week after that post, Gore watched the live stream of a Granbury school board meeting on her laptop from a hotel room along Mexico's Caribbean coast while on an anniversary trip with her husband. So she was playing hooky from her, her job on the Granbury ISD board. But emotions ran high at that meeting, as about a dozen residents complained that board members had not removed enough books from the library. That was their big concern. Some argued that the school board was stifling dissent from graft by uh, one of the other school board members by requiring the consent of two board members to place an item on the agenda. You know, rules are rules, but they were very upset about uh, not knowing them and not being able to pull their stunts. During the meeting, Cliff Criswell, the grandfather of Nate Criswell, wasn't that one of the uh, consultants involved in all of this, took the microphone, carrying what police would later describe as a black handgun in a leather holster. That's all we need at the school board meeting. He accused board members of allowing pornography in school libraries and of trying to rip apart Graft, whom he had previously described as the only conservative on the board. And so I'm here with my gun to let you know that you should stop attacking uh, somebody I support on the board. And also, what about all this pornography? And uh, I'll make you agree that it's pornography at gunpoint. That'll work. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time. Just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad. Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction and Whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure, recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't, do it without you. Hope you'll be on board soon too. Thanks for all your support. All right, welcome back now to the Kangaroo in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's see what we got here. We were, once again, in the middle of the Texas Tribune article about Courtney Gore, who uh, had the epiphany of finding out that uh, the right-wing culture war agenda on which she had been elected to the Granbury school district board in texas was in fact uh stuff and nonsense to put it uh in the old-fashioned way uh and then uh reacted appropriately as most normal people would saying hey this has all been bs and i want everybody to know it and uh describing the backlash against that so that's uh one of the board meetings in which she was not in attendance she was watching remotely however we are told that uh, Cliff Criswell, one of the, the grandfather of Nate Criswell, who's uh, I can't recall exactly what role Criswell is playing in all of this, but I think one of the consultants that helped to elect both Gore and, uh, as a candidate anyway, fellow conservative 
uh, uh, board member Graft, that's not a mistake, that's actually the name of the person, uh, to the board, and then complaining again that uh, having brought a gun to the school board meeting, complaining that not enough pornography was being removed from school libraries, so let's get around to it. We have profile sheets on all trustees, except for Graft, Criswell shouted. We know what you do. We know where you live. So that's kind of interesting. We have profile sheets. We've been profiling all of you for unknown reasons. And then, of course, the hint of we know who you are. We know what you do. We know where you live. Uh, we're tracking everybody except Graft because Graft will never change their mind the way Gore did. Hmm, why don't we have one on Graft, too, just in case? Well, Gore was shocked from a distance. Panicked, she started calling family members. My grandmother was home with our children, she recalled in an interview. My brother came over and slept on my front porch to make sure nobody showed up at our house in the middle of the night. I mean, my kids were terrified after that. I don't know if I would have told them, but... Uh, and, uh, eh, you know, you want to take care of your kids and you want to protect them the best you can. It's not a great look to be missing a meeting for one thing and then to find out that there are well to find out for the first time i don't think so that there are lunatics in texas who will hold this against you and will threaten your family but i guess i'll go on vacation and leave the kids at home all right well whatever she did her best later that night gore addressed the incident on facebook you know taking it seriously going on facebook tonight threats were made against me every board member except one and our superintendent we were individually called out by name, told we had profile sheets, which just sounds like garbage, quite honestly, made on each of us that we would be dealt with accordingly. This is not okay. Oh, <laughs> that'll stop them. This is not okay. Okay, thanks. I take threats against myself, wrong, and my family seriously, especially with all of the violence in today's world. We will be dealing with school board, or will we be dealing with school board shootings next? Well, it's, you know, what is that any less logical than school shootings? I don't know. We must do better. She's not really a rhetorician per se, but okay. We get the point. In response to a commenter's message of support, Gore wrote, extremism is the problem. Well, okay, that seems true. According to a Granbury police report, an off-duty officer spotted a black pistol in a holster on Cliff Chriswell's waistband and alerted school and city police, even though that's supposedly probably okay in Texas. Anyway, possession of an unauthorized firearm at a school board meeting, though, is a third degree felony under state law because officers, or rather, but because officers didn't conclusively identify the weapon that night and because Cliff Chriswell declined to cooperate, prosecutors were unable to file those charges, said Granbury Police Deputy Chief Cliff Andrews. Cliff Criswell could not be reached for comment. Time out just for a second. Uh, does anybody think that the police stop? And you know, I can't quite, I can't conclusively identify the weapon on that, let's say, black suspect. Oh, well, you know, we, well, it's not so, only so much we could, you know, it's immediately, if you have a, a phone in your hand, a, 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 a Two-way radio, and I don't know, anything in your hand. It doesn't really matter what, an ice cream cone in your hand. Gun! And everybody's firing wildly. But not at Cliff Criswell. You know. But whatever. Okay. Had we identified the gun at the very moment? Yes, absolutely. We could have filed charges on it, Andrew said. We made a simple mistake. That is interesting, isn't it? All by itself, that's the story. The incident forced the district to adopt tighter security measures, including clearly posting signs prohibiting firearms. Ah. And bringing in additional officers during board meetings anytime administrators expect that certain topics, so to speak, could lead to heated exchanges. That was the moment I saw how crazy it was, how unhinged it had become, and how far some people were willing to go to prove their points, Gore said. Well, she came around to it eventually. Like, I, I think probably the rest of us realized how crazy and unhinged it was when people were saying, there's pornography in the school library. Kids are crapping in litter boxes. Yeah, okay, I think this is crazy. But you wait, bide your time, and see if they show up with guns. And then you can decide whether you think it's crazy at that point. Yet, rhetoric over the school district only ratcheted up. 
in the ensuing months. That fall, Hood counties, that's the county, far-right leaders, and appropriate, isn't it? Hood county. The far-right leaders backed the school board candidacy of Karen Lowry. They got an actual Karen for this job, who in May of 2022 was one of two women who filed a criminal complaint against district librarians. That's the person to elect. Claiming they were providing pornography to children. Come on. A Hood County constable has declined to answer questions about the status of the complaint. At least they're not prosecuting that one, I hope. They can't get the guy with the gun charge. All right. And this one they're going to pursue. Lowry, who had served on the committee that reviewed library books but opposed returning them to the shelves, also received a key endorsement from Rafael Cruz. Remember, he made an earlier appearance in this story. She went on to win her election in November of 2022. Her victory helped resurface the district's book battles as she pressed to remove more titles. Then, in August of 2023, Lowry snuck into a high school library. That's always super fun and legal and what you want your elected officials doing. During a charity event, and then began inspecting books using the light of her cell phone, according to a district report. It's not enough for them to break into the campaign uh, or the elections offices anymore. They're now breaking into the library. Uh, I'm just secretly breaking into the library at night and using my flashlight to look for porn. I mean, I mean, to get rid of it. Yeah, okay, whatever. School board members met to discuss censuring Lowry at an August 23rd public meeting for violating a policy that requires... <laughs> How about just breaking and entering? Violating a policy that requires them to get permission from principals when entering a campus and for not being truthful when confronted by an administrator. Lowry claimed she had disclosed her visit to the library beforehand as required. She did not respond to calls or emails seeking comment. A district spokesperson said she, that he was unable to pass along an interview request. Oh, can't even do that, huh? Because Lowry had requested to only be contacted through her board email. The board voted to censure Lowry, who opposed the symbolic measure along with Graft. It is clear that the actions Mrs. Mrs. Lowry took as evidenced by the community and the outcry that we have heard tonight has broken some of that trust with our staff, parents, and community members, said Gore, who motioned to censure Lowry. The only people that pay the price for this, no matter what happens tonight, are the kids of this district. All right. Next section, old foe, new friend. By November of 2023, the battle lines over school vouchers were hardening in Granbury and at the state capitol in Austin. Abbott. Greg Abbott, the governor, had begun waging war against Republicans who had not supported voucher efforts and contributed to their failure during the last legislative session. One lawmaker who escaped Abbott's wrath was Shel Shelby Slauson, a Republican who represented Hood County, as it happens. Unlike some of those now being targeted, Slauson had bucked a request spearheaded by Gore and supported by the school board majority that urged lawmakers to vote against a measure that would send public dollars to private schools. Slauson did not respond to questions regarding her decision, her decision, Shelby Slauson, to vote in favor of vouchers despite the local school board district's opposition in the legislation. Meanwhile, Granberry was tacing, facing a tough election the school district was asking voters to approve a $151 million bond measure to build a new elementary school in the rapidly growing and overcrowded district, as well as provide security updates and renovations to aging campuses. The balance of the school board was also at stake in the same election. The bond, oh, bond opponents formed the Granbury Families Political Action Committee. In advertising materials, the group cited library books as one of the principal reasons residents had lost trust in the board. Come on. Our community has lost faith in the board's ability to conduct business, the group claimed. Not another penny until GISD gets new leadership. Nate Criswell, Gore's former co-host and campaign manager, that clears that part up, loaned that pack, loaned, $1,750. According to campaign finance reports filed with the district, the loan constituted about 40% of the PAC's funding ahead of the November election. Although a majority of the state's school districts with bond measures scored victories, Granbury's tax measure failed once again. Voters rejected another bond measure this month, 
Hardline conservatives celebrated the loss, pointing to anger over library books as the issue. But even as they celebrated, the November election delivered a setback to those who want to take over the school board. The two candidates supported by hardline conservatives lost by wide margins, denying the county's far-right faction the majority on the board. Among the winners in that election were Nancy Alana, the school board member whom Gore ousted two years earlier. This time around, Gore endorsed Alana, and the two former opponents have since become friends and allies. She let everybody know that she had been misled and that she had seen for herself the good things that are happening in our school district. Alana said that the school board can be trusted, that the administrators can be trusted. And she has spoken out on that, and that has made a big difference. And she is very well thought of in our community because of her willingness to step up and say, I was wrong. Hmm. That is a good point. Wait. Oh, okay. Hold on a second. I was going to say there's more. But no, it's actually them saying, wait, we need your help. Please donate to the Texas Tribune, which, of course, you have every opportunity to do. Go ahead. Take a look. If you enjoyed the story, I encourage you to read it for yourself. Perhaps if you want to make a contribution, you can go ahead and do that. It's funny how they make that look like part of the text of the, not really. I guess it's set off from there. That's actually the end of the story. We made it to the end. It was a very long read. Uh, And now it gives us the opportunity to head back to pocket for something else that has been sitting and waiting that I think will add some additional context. You may already have read this story if you are a New York Times subscriber, uh, but many of you have run away (laughs) from uh, the New York Times subscriptions of late, I am sure, because they have annoyed you with one story or opinion piece or another, and so uh, it's possible you haven't picked up on this one. Oh, oh, well... Uh, unless, of course, uh, it has nothing whatsoever to do with the New York Times. It, I think the people in it are New York-based, but the story was, in fact, published in the Washington Post, which is another paper that you may have unsubscribed from. Uh, I don't know. I guess it wasn't reported elsewhere because it's described as an exclusive here. Let's just get right to it, shall we? Business titans privately urged NYC mayor, New York City mayor, to use police on Columbia protesters chats show that's a weird kind of a headline and um i mean that's the thing that's most directly obvious from this discussion but there are many many other takeaways from this uh then exclusive story which may or may not have been uh, explored by other papers along the way what's going on a whatsapp chat started by some wealthy americans after the october 7th hamas attack reveals their focus on Mayor Eric Adams and their work to shape U.S. opinion of the Gaza war. It's interesting. Who starts, which sorts of wealthy Americans would start a WhatsApp chat ever, for one thing, uh, but start a WhatsApp chat after the October 7th Hamas attacks with the concern being shaping U.S. opinion of the Gaza war. Uh, There's a lot of time that's passed after the October 7th attacks, and what are we into, the six months here, so we're not sure exactly when they started. Uh, But if you started on October 8th, for instance, your concern at that point is predictable, but your concern probably wasn't U.S. opinion of the Gaza war. I would imagine that this group started sometime thereafter when the shape of the Gaza war was becoming obvious. But anyway... Um, you might wonder about what sort of wealthy individuals would decide that they need a WhatsApp chat about response to the October 7th attacks and how they should pressure the mayor of New York City with regard to that conflict in Gaza. It doesn't hold together as a premise until you get the further details. Hannah Natanson and Emmanuel Felton are the authors of this piece. Natanson, I guess that's Nathan, like Nathan, 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 Natanson, Hannah's first uh, last name. So, all right. Well, anyway, here's the story. And uh, if, if you've heard about it, you, you can see the hesitation in beginning on this story. A group of billionaires and business titans working to shape U.S. public opinion Of what? Of the war in Gaza. Really? Privately pressed New York City's mayor last month 
They were the ones, I guess, who privately pressed the, the mayor to send police to disperse pro-Palestinian protests at Columbia University, according to communications obtained by the Washington Post and people familiar with the group. It's not, well, it's hard to believe just in the sense of what are you doing? But it's not hard to believe given, well, the results and what happened in Columbia. And I'm thinking, as I've mentioned before, between the fact that the president of Columbia is her, herself uh any of Egyptian extraction, a Egyptian Muslim woman, I don't know if she's practicing religiously, but uh, who you could see being under extraordinary pressure to react in this protest centered around Middle Eastern policy issues. And of course, she's right in the middle of New York City, which is in the spotlight all the time about everything. Even if you had a normal mayor with a normal brain, you would still be in the spotlight in all of this. But since you have Eric Adams and weirdo Republican reactionaries running uh, the U.S. House of Representatives and, of course, grilling Ivy League presidents about supposed anti-Semitism on these campuses and Certainly there is anti-Semitism on these campuses, but but uh, it, it, conducting this investigation such that it is alleged that all activities of all kinds surrounding the protests and everything else that happens on campus is really all about anti-Semitism because that's a bad thing. And if it's happening, you can blame the presidents and let's oust them. And if that doesn't work, we'll claim that they're plagiarists. And if that doesn't work, oh, don't worry about it. It'll always work. Oh, okay. Uh then we'll get rid of them. And in the middle of all this, though, you know, they're pressuring all all politicians everywhere. Eric Adams, uh, by so many people's descriptions, is essentially ends up being a Republican at heart and certainly has a, a different kind of relationship with the police, is having come from among their ranks, than other mayors in other cities. I think the combination of Eric Adams, the spotlight of New York, the personal background of the president of Columbia mm, helped make it all possible, let's say. So now we find out that this group was also adding its own pressure. Business executives, including Kind Snack Company founder. Oh, well, that's going to change my feelings about them. That's not very kind. Kind Snack Company founder Daniel Lubetsky. Hedge fund manager, we love hedge fund managers, right? Daniel Loeb, L-O-E-B, billionaire Len Blavatnik, and real estate investor Joseph Sitt, S-I-T-T, held a Zoom video call on April 26th with Mayor Eric Adams, about a week after the mayor first sent New York City police to Columbia's campus, a log of chat messages shows, so... It had already happened by the time they had this Zoom meeting. During the call, some attendees discussed making political donations to Adams, as well as how the chat group's members could pressure Columbia's president and trustees to permit the mayor to send police to the campus to handle protesters, which had already happened. But I guess they needed to send them again, in their view. According to chat messages summarizing the conversation, one group, uh, one member of the WhatsApp chat group told the Post he donated $2,100, the maximum legal limit, which explains why are we supposed to care about a billionaire's contribution of $2,000. That's the legal maximum limit to Adams that month. Some members also offered to pay for private investigators, for some reason, to assist New York police in handling the protests, the chat log shows, and offer a member of the group reported in the chat that Adams accepted. That's amazing in its own right. The New York Police Department is not using and has not used private investigators to help manage protests, a spokeswoman for City Hall said. The messages describing the call with Adams were among thousands logged in a WhatsApp chat among some of the nation's most prominent business leaders and financiers, including former Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz. I didn't realize he was former. Dell founder and CEO Michael Dell, hedge fund manager Bill Ackman, and Joshua Kushner, founder of Thrive Capital and brother of Jared Kushner, former President Donald Trump's son-in-law. These guys all have nothing to do, apparently. 
Yeah, it's amazing how they're, uh, I make the big bucks because I work so hard. And I really, when I say work so hard, I mean I hang out in a WhatsApp chat group complaining about anti-Semitism because there's a protest at Columbia University. You got to have something else to do. And all this money floating around too. I mean, uh, it, anyway, you can see, uh, you, you're probably going to see where this whole thing is going, why they're so concerned about the protests too. And if you guys need something to do, uh, there's a small... Uh, synagogue in uh, my area that could use large donations to renovate its interior if you if you want to help build community or something like that, as opposed to hiring private investigators to find out whether college kids are pro-Palestinian or not. They're, they're holding signs. They are pro-Palestinian. Sorry. Uh, didn't mean to ruin your your whole plot there. Anyway, people with direct access to the chat logs contents supplied them to the post. They shared the information on the condition of anonymity because the chat's contents were meant to stay private. So much for that. Members of the group verified the chat's existence and their comments. The chat was initiated by a staffer for billionaire and real estate magnate Barry Sternlicht, who never joined directly. That's really amazing. So the whole WhatsApp thing was initiated by somebody who worked for Stein, Sternlicht, but Sternlicht didn't participate. That's a weird thing all by itself. That uh, He never joined it directly, but uh, but he did instead communicate through the staffer with all the rest of these people, according to chat messages and a person close to Sternlicht. In an October 12th message, one of the first sent in the group, so I guess it really did start pretty soon after October 7th, the staffer posting on behalf of Sternlicht told the others the goal of the group was to, quote, change the narrative in favor of Israel, partly by conveying the atrocities committed by Hamas to all Americans, which is kind of an amazing thing uh, that from attacks on October 7th by October 12th, they already knew that they needed to, quote unquote, change the narrative, which I don't recall necessarily being the case at the time. Though I'm sure that attacks on Gaza had already begun and that they were already fairly massive, but I don't know if they had actually lost control of the narrative by October 12th, but these people certainly think so, which if true, could be true, uh, I guess just speaks to the, um, I don't know, the barbarity of the response in the imme days immediately following October 7th. But anyway, Israel estimates that 1,200 people were killed in Hamas's October 7th attacks. In the months since the war began, the death toll in Gaza has risen, of course, above 35,000, according to the Gaza Health Ministry. That's not really all that helpful because it speaks to the entirety of the conflict. It's really, I would say, what was the uh, situation as of October 12th? But anyway, the chat group formed shortly after the October 7th attack and its activism has stretched beyond New York, touching the highest levels of the Israeli government, the U.S. business world and elite universities. Titled Israel Current Events, the chat eventually expanded to about 100 members, the chat log shows. More than a dozen members of the group appear on Forbes' annual list of billionaires. Others work in real estate, finance and communications. Overall, the messages offer a window into how some prominent individuals have wielded their money and power in an effort to shape American views of the Gaza war, not very well, by the way, as well as the actions of academic, business, and political leaders, including New York's mayor. In other words, it's so interesting. The idea here is, why don't we do the trope? Why don't we do the thing where everyone suspects uh, the wealthy American Jews of secretly plotting behind the scenes to drive public opinion in one direction or another. And then if we're caught, we can say, we don't do that. That's an anti-Semitic trope. That'd be perfect. What great cover. Oops. All right. Well, it's unfortunate to have that happening. He, let's see. So what have we, oh yes, we left off that they were saying they were trying to influence academic business and political leaders, including New York's mayor, at about whom they said he's open to any ideas we have chat member sit founder of the retail chain ashley stewart and the global real estate company thor equities 
wrote on April 27th, the day after the group's Zoom call with Adams. As you saw, he's okay if we hire private investigators to then have his police force intel team work with them. You don't need to do any private funding for the New York City Police Department guys. Sit declined to comment through a spokeswoman. A half dozen prominent members of the group confirmed on the record their participation in the chat. Multiple people familiar with the group confirmed the names of the members. Cypriot Israeli real estate billionaire Yakir Gabe wrote in a statement shared by a spokesperson that he joined the group because he wanted to, quote, share support at a difficult and painful time, unquote, to aid the victims of Hamas attacks and to, quote, try and correct the false and misleading information intentionally spread worldwide to deny or cover up the suffering caused by Hamas. Asked about the Zoom meeting with chat group members, the mayor's office did not directly address it. Instead, sharing a statement from Deputy Mayor Fabian Levy, noting that New York police entered Columbia's campus twice in response to specific written requests from university leadership. Any suggestion that other considerations were involved in the decision-making process is completely false, Levy said. He added, the insinuation, here it is, that Jewish donors secretly plotted to influence government operations is an all-too-familiar anti-Semitic trope that the Washington Post should be ashamed to ask about, let alone normalize in print. Except, of course, you know, no one's saying they were controlling the weather or the entire world or the global financial system or anything like that. But there was this discussion. I mean, there, there are discussion groups among Jews, yes? And there are discussion groups among wealthy Jews, yeah? And they're aimed at changing U.S. Uh, public opinion of what's going on in the Middle East. Yeah. All right. Well, then, I mean, it's just that. It's not an anti-Semitic trope. But, of course, that's a great way to deflect things or to uh, try and throw people off the story. Adams demonstrated a willingness to send law enforcement to deal with campus protesters from the beginning. And in other words, I think they, they probably didn't even really need to do this. But he sent police to Columbia's campus to disperse pro-Palestinian demonstrators on April 18th at the university's request, of course, about a day after protesters erected their Gaza Solidarity encampment. Officers arrested more than 100 protesters. The mayor has subsequently alleged that student activists were affected by outside influences and that police intervention was needed to prevent children from being radicalized. Hmm. Well, definitely a specious call there, but not entirely uh, attributable to any sort of Zoom call with anybody. That Zoom call hadn't happened yet, by the way. All right, welcome back now to the Keg Gordon Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's continue with reading about how the fact that a bunch of uh, billionaire Jewish uh, political donors got together on a WhatsApp chat in order to decide to try to help influence U.S. public opinion about the war in Gaza is totally not that thing that you're thinking about. Okay? Uh, so let's see. He, we were just reading about uh, how the mayor or the mayor sent the deputy mayor to say that, no, 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 this is all about responding to Colombia's request to disperse the demonstrators and the outside influences that ha are radicalizing children. They are, of course, young adults, but hey, uh, whatever. Both he and Colombia's president have since drawn criticism. Yes, that's true. But also support for involving the police, adding to a fraught stretch for Adams, who is up for re-election in 2025 and faces... At the same time, an FBI corruption investigation into whether his 2021 campaign received illegal donations from Turkey. Adams has defended that campaign, saying he held it to the highest ethical standards. Whatever. Four days after chat members held the video call with Adams, student protesters occupied a campus building, and Colombia's president invited the police back to campus to clear the building. Officers removed and arrested dozens of protesters, pushing, striking, and dragging students in the process, the Post reported. One officer accidentally fired his gun. We did mention that, I think, at the time. Months before the protests at Columbia this spring, 
Some chat members attended private briefings with former Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. Benny Gantz, a member of the Israeli War Cabinet and Israel's ambassador to the United States, Michael Herzog, according to chat records. Members of the group also worked with the Israeli government to screen a roughly 40-minute film showing footage compiled by the IDF titled Bearing Witness to the October 7th Massacre and screening it to audiences in New York City. The film portrays killings committed by Hamas. A chat member asked for help from other members to show the film at universities. It was later screened at Harvard. A showing chat member Ackman helped facilitate, attended, and promoted publicly. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, just showing the level of involvement that uh, some of the billionaires were, in fact, personally motivated to push these things uh, on campuses. So now, Ackman was the one who was, wasn't he like most directly involved in pushing out Claudine Gay, right? So, I mean, <clears throat> He was in the middle of his own campus campus activism uh, and protest, about which, by the way, nobody called the police. But at any rate, um, just demonstrating, one, he's part of the chat group as well and uh, has also made a big splash and, and uh, made waves and made a name for himself by involving himself in the activity at Harvard and that resulted in the dismissal of the president or the resignation of the president. Sternlicht declined to comment on the record, although a person close to him, speaking on condition of anonymity because he was not authorized to discuss the chat group publicly, confirmed the real estate tycoon initiated the chat. So we got some confirmation on that. Other members of the chat, including Ackman and Schultz, confirmed their membership. A spokesman said that Ackman had not participated in the chat since January 10th, adding that Ackman never spoke to Adams about the Columbia protests or donated to Adams' campaign, although Ackman likes and is supportive of the mayor. Joshua Kushner declined to comment. On October 12th, a staffer for Sternlicht relayed a message from his boss outlining the group's mission. I love that he's founding the group, but he won't, he won't deign to show up himself. Interesting. Anyway, what's the group's mission? While Israel worked to, quote, win the physical war, the chat group's members would help win the war of U.S. public opinion by funding an information campaign against Hamas. Okay. The campaign was referred to in the chat as Facts for Peace. Hmm. The news site Semaphore reported in November that Sternlicht was launching a $50 million anti-Hamas media campaign with various Wall Street and Hollywood billionaires. The people involved, per Semaphore's reporting, included some members of the WhatsApp chat, a review by The Post found. The chat messages, the contents of which have never before been reported, appear to reveal the start of a campaign as well as separate pro-Israel activities undertaken later by chat members. It is unclear to what extent the chat group and media campaign overlapped. Some of the media's campaign act, some of the media campaign's activities were public, including its website and Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter accounts together, with, uh, which attracted more than 170,000 followers. That's not a super fantastic, uh, result for a, a billionaire-funded $50 million anti-Hamas media campaign, but it's there. And I guess I'll say also, it's not entirely clear that the chat group is actually coordinating this thing. It sounds like they were using the chat group to see whether they might be able to solicit more support and more money and maybe some more coordination for these activities, but it sounds like the activities were taking place outside of the chat group. The chat group just sounds like, you know, a big waste of time, if you ask me. High-level contacts and private briefings is the next section here. At a moment of rising anti-Semitism, the staffer for Sternlicht wrote in one of the first chat messages that his boss was proud of his Jewish heritage. Jew is. What a scary prospect to tell another group of Jewish high-profile donors. And wanted to support Israel but was also concerned about security. 
anonymity, the staffer wrote on October 12th on Sterling's behalf, is a practical need and concern for safety of my family in an increasingly complex world. Uh, okay, so Sternlicht's safety of Sternlicht's family, not the staffer. The staffer wrote that Sternlicht understood if other members felt similarly and promised that all contributions to the media campaign would remain anonymous. I'm sensitive to concerns about being less effective if it appears that this is a Jewish initiative. The staffer wrote, speaking again for Sternlicht, from the start of the chat, members sought guidance and information from officials of, in the Israeli government. Some of the WhatsApp chat members said in the chat they attended private briefings about the Gaza war with Israeli war cabinet member Gantz, former Prime Minister Bennett and Herzog, the ambassador. The chat log shows Zoom invites for these meetings. Most appreciative for the behind-the-scenes briefing by Naftali Bennett, Schultz, the former CEO of Starbucks, wrote, to the group on October 16th. Quite extraordinary. I, I, I have to imagine it, it actually was not all that extraordinary, but, you know, it makes big donors feel special when the big names show up for any event like that and uh, mix and rub elbows with them, even though nothing different is happening. Uh, sometimes, even if something different does happen, I mean, that would be... That would be extraordinary, and you know it's unfair that uh, the billionaires always have the insider access. But I will say, more often than not, it's just a dog and pony show, and it's just like, wow, I got to talk to the Israeli prime minister or a former Israeli prime minister or a former UN ambassador or a former this, that, and the other thing. Uh, they're insiders, and they, they tell you confidentially. I don't know if you know this, but we're involved in a war against Hamas in Gaza. And they're doing really, really bad stuff. But we're going to get them. Ooh. You know, nothing changes. Nothing, nothing different is done. But uh, the, the other, well, some of the dumb stuff, like offering private investigators and to pay for private investigators, seems uh, above and beyond, but also probably never came together. I could see lots of money and time and effort being wasted on that. Bennett did not respond to a request for comment. Gantz could not be reached for comment. A spokesperson for the Israeli embassy in Washington and the, said the briefing that Herzog gave chat members was, quote, one of dozens the ambassador delivered that month, adding that communities here in the U.S. understandably wanted to learn more about what was happening on the ground in Israel. And that actually rings true to me. Uh, it's unlikely that Herzog uh, considered that to be any sort of, you know, plot or any sort of uh, activity likely to lead to more or different activity, uh, more or different uh, outcomes than, you know, uh, briefing a local Jewish federation group that was, you know, attended by all of the uh, representatives of all the synagogues and Jewish organizations in the city, whatever it might be, uh, you know. It's just that's what they occupy their day with. Anyway, a spokesperson for Schultz confirmed in a statement that he attended the briefing with Bennett. But Schultz, we're, we're really this worried about the former Starbucks CEO. Schultz said he did not participate in or contribute financially to any of the group's work. Uh, he probably contributed to uh, other groups' work. That It's just, again... As interesting as this is, that there's such coordination, the chat group doesn't appear to have actually done anything. Schultz was neither involved in discussions about Adams and the Columbia protests, nor screenings of the film, according to the spokesman. There's like just five different overlapping, individually not very impactful things that are happening here. In late October, the chat records show chat members appear to have suggested to Israeli officials that they should hold a private New York City screening for media members of Bearing Witness, the IDF film, featuring graphic footage recorded by Hamas gunmen on body cameras and cell phones as they attacked Israel. Sit wrote in a message to the group on October 27th that Israeli officials wanted to thank them for coming up with the concept of the press event in New York City, which I'm sure they had already thought of, but okay. I mean, it's pretty straightforward, uh, you know, and there's probably even value to it, but, uh, you know, is it a super great idea? Thank you for giving us the super secret insight into American politics. If we show 
uh, our version of the facts of October 7th to the media, they might report it. Hmm. Wow. That is, thank God there was a billionaire there to tell me that. The next month, the group showed the film in New York. Record show. Isn't that amazing? They said, we should show this film in New York. And then they did show the film in New York. All right. Well, Sit wrote on November 10th that the Israeli government, quote, arranged for us, unquote, to screen the film in Gotham Hall on November 17th, adding in a later message, the showing, quote, will be listed as an IDF event not affiliated to Facts for Peace to keep them separate. In the ensuing months, group members wrote in the chat to flag news articles or social media posts about Israel, events in Gaza, or later college campus protests. So, did you read this in the newspaper? Yes, I did read this in the newspaper. Okay. You know. <laughs> what does that do? All right. Next section. So, NYPD can return. That's the header on this next section. Columbia students first set up an encampment on October. April 17th, eventually leading some Jewish students to allege that the protests had forged a hostile and harassing atmosphere. Police stepped in to clear the encampment at the Columbia president's request on April 18th, arresting more than 100 demonstrators. In the chat, discussions of how Adams was handling the Columbia protests and how group members could help took off the following day, after student protesters built a new encampment to replace the demolished one, Lubetsky of the snack company Kind, not very kind, posted in the chat a uh, sharing a link to an Instagram video showing an Israeli Arab journalist getting hit by a man the video caption claims is an anti-Israel protester. Not long after, Billionaire Blavatnik posted a picture of Adams and wrote, he needs help. Uh -huh. Sit responded that he had already, quote, been helping, but can use more support. He asked if others were open to giving to Adams. Gabay, the Cypriot Israeli real estate billionaire, replied, please send the info. Thanks. Then Blavatnik posted an Act Blue link allowing donations to the Eric Adams 2025 committee. I don't know. Somehow it's starting to feel like... Okay. So, uh, uh, the mayor could use some political support. All right, uh, send the info. Oh, here's the secret Act Blue link. You know, like, all right. It's not that different from regular person chat so far. Lubetsky messaged, if there is a group to contribute through or a way to ensure our contributions are known to be related to his efforts to fight anti-Semitism and hate, please let us know and I will support meaningfully alongside you guys. Sit replied that he was arranging a, quote, code for such donations. Asked about this message, Vito Pitta Counsel to Adams' 2025 campaign said, there is no special code for contributions. But here I would say, uh, it's not all that different from the, um, uh, the habit that people developed in years past on Act Blue of making donations and adding an extra penny to the donations as a sort of uh, informal messaging to the campaigns that these are coming from, you know, Netroots denizens. Remember when we used to add one penny to a contribution and uh, that way a savvy campaign manager could point to all of those and say, these are all, you know, people who participate through uh, in, in online, in uh, online giving uh, because they are extremely online people, Netroots denizens or uh, people who had attended Netroots Nation uh, conventions, et cetera, you know, progressive donors and, uh, they just were, I guess, essentially saying, is there some way to do that? Or can we pool our resources and bundle contributions such that it's understood to be coming from people who have a certain view of Israel? But basically, they said, eh, nobody's going to bother uh, organizing such a group. Let's have a code. And it's not even clear whether they came up with one. Spokespeople for Lubetsky, Sit, and Gabe said they did not donate to Adams. <laughs> Loeb declined to comment. In the chat, discussion turned to the fact that Columbia had to grant Adams permission before he could send city police to the campus. One member asked the group 
or if the group could do anything to pressure Columbia trustees to cooperate with the mayor, although it doesn't sound like it was necessary. In reply, former Congressman Ted Deutsch of Florida, a Democrat, CEO of the American Jewish Committee, shared a PDF of a letter his organization had sent that day to Columbia President Minouche Shafiq, calling on her to shut these protests down. Also in touch with the board, Deutsch wrote to the chat group, so NYPD can return, which it could anyway, because it was being invited by the trustees as it happens anyhow. They, nothing happened here so far. It's a bunch of people bragging or pretending that they have direct lines of influence, which they could because they're billionaires, lobbyists, former politicians, etc. But it all seems like pretty routine stuff. Um and they're just, you know, these are people who are used to operating in boardrooms and they love to say things to claim credit for activities taking place in the real world. All right. Asked for comment, a spokeswoman for Deutsch wrote in an email uh, to the Post that the American Jewish Committee, quote, values all opportunities to engage with various individuals and institutions who support the Jewish people in the state of Israel. Asked about the chat group and its activities, a Columbia spokesperson wrote, we have no knowledge of this. Columbia spokesperson wrote about this. Uh, that's an interesting little switch there, by the way. In the same paragraph, uh, asked for comment. They talked to a spokeswoman for Deutsch who writes about the American Jewish Committee and its interest in speaking to people and individuals and institutions who support Jewish people and the state of Israel, and then a switch over to Columbia's spokesperson saying they have no knowledge of the chat group, which is kind of different. I don't know. A Zoom video call with chat group members and Adams took place a little after 11 a.m. on April 26th, according to chat records. It is unclear how many members attended the meeting which lasted roughly 45 minutes, chat record show. Those present included at least Blavatnik, Sit, Loeb, and Lubetsky, according to the chat logs. Sit wrote minutes after the call ended to summarize. He didn't write the minutes of the meeting. He wrote a few minutes after the call ended, see, to summarize items, that does sound like minutes, discussed today, including donations to Adams, using group members' leverage, unquote, quote, unquote, uh, to help persuade Columbia's president to let New York police back on campus. This was not a problem. And paying for, quote, investigative efforts, unquote, to assist the city. It is unclear whether any of those things actually happened, apparently, according to previous writing in this piece. And again, I don't know. I mean, it, it, there are serious implications anytime a bunch of billionaires get together. And I don't love the fact that they were trying to uh, deflect attention to it by pretending that asking what happened at this thing that did happen is anti-Semitism. But it also really doesn't look like these guys are any more organized than they usually are. It's just a bunch of, I don't know, it's like a a bunch of, of peacocking going on here, it seems to me. Anyway, Lubetsky replied, listing concrete actions group members should take. I mean, I can list concrete actions people should take. Do they take them? Do they take them under my auspices? Do they take them at all? I don't know. What are they? Well, they included resharing a link to offer financial support to Adams. That is, I mean, it's, it is concrete. I did give you this link. It's about as abstract as a concrete action could be. But, you know, you have the opportunity to do something concrete now that I've given you this link. It's better than saying there are links out there or go look at Act Blue. But (laughs) it's really not much of an action. Uh, It is very typical, uh, though, sometimes of these billionaires. They really think that, you know, well, I gave you the, the, you know, the link. So that's concrete activity. Yes, J.D., yes, J.D., yes, sure, J.D., sure thing, J.D., you're a real concrete guy. It's just like every, you know, every one of these so-called high achievers, the every day, and they're early risers because every minute of every day is about people telling them what concrete actors they are. Anyway, let's see. Lubetsky, uh, okay, right. He replied listing concrete actions they could, could take, like supporting Adams, uh, calling and writing to Columbia's president and board of trustees, and, quote, 
getting black leaders to condemn anti-Semitism, unquote. This is getting less concrete by the minute. He named several people he would contact and ask if anyone in the group knew Jay-Z, LeBron James, or Alicia Keys. I know some black people. Do any of you guys know some black people? Uh, you're rich. They're rich. Let's talk to them. Maybe uh, one or another of them think that we control their careers. Let's get them to condemn anti-Semitism. Again, I mean, it's a thing. It counts as concrete if it actually happens, but it's just a bunch of people saying, well, we hope bad stuff doesn't happen. Let's stop anti-Semitism, everyone. Yeah, you're right. It's just not that concrete. Anyway, asked about his comments. Lubetsky wrote in a statement to the Post that, quote, building bridges between the black and Jewish communities is, is more important than ever. And there's nothing particularly nefarious about it, unless, of course, you say, uh, does anybody think they can destroy these people's careers if they don't comply? I mean... These are not people whose careers can be destroyed this way. Uh, so hopefully they weren't even asking that question. But it doesn't appear that they were. Does anybody know them? Yeah, I know them. Well, can you ask them if they'll condemn anti-Semitism? Sure, I'll ask. And, you know, in, in general, people never get around to asking. But if you do ask, like, would LeBron James say he's against anti-Semitism? Sure. Why not? Of course he would. Would he say that they should shut down these protests? That you're probably not going to get out of him. Uh, don't even try. Blavatnik, through a spokesman, uh, confirmed he attended the Zoom meeting with Adams, but said he did not, quote, participate in a conversation about private investigators and is unaware of discussions related to that subject, unquote. The spokeswoman noted other people on the Zoom said things that Blavatnik did not weigh in on or agree with. She said the billionaire, a Columbia alumnus and donor, only joined the Zoom to understand how Adams, quote, was thinking about the Columbia protests. The evening after the call, SIT shared an Act Blue link for donations to Adams' 2025 committee. And, uh, oh, here's a picture of uh, Lubetsky in a kind branded sweatsuit top. In case you wondered how he spends his days. The chat did not record who donated money to Adams, nor how much. The New York City Campaign Finance Board website shows donations set up only to January, sent up only to January of this year. More recent donations will not become public until July. Okay. Pitta, P-I-T-T-A, the Adams campaign lawyer, said the campaign had not received donations from Lubetsky, Loeb, Sit, or Gabe. I mean, maybe from the companies, maybe from executives in the company. I don't know, but probably not. Again, it's just more talk and no action, these things. It's just generally true of these chat groups. He confirmed Blavatnik had donated, but did not respond to questions asking about the timing of Blavatnik's donation. A day after the April 26th Zoom with Adams, Loeb wrote the chat group to share reflections on what transpired during the call. He wrote that it was a sad state that we feel the need to grovel to ask our elected officials to do their jobs, he added. I'll be grateful when the perpetrators are dragged off campus. I mean, it is revealing in who's a bad actor with respect to their uh, regard for First Amendment rights. But uh, in terms of cataloging concrete activities there's just not that much here police returned to Colombia, of course on april 30th arresting dozens of demonstrators who had occupied a university building Colombia president shafiq had requested law enforcement's aid in a letter writing that the takeover of hamilton hall raised serious safety concerns she asked the police to remain on campus through at least may 17th the morning afterward, Adams gave a news conference summarizing the action. We went in and conducted an operation, he said, to remove those who have turned the peaceful protests into a place where anti-Semitism and anti-Israel attitudes were pervasive. In early May, seven months since its inception, the chat was shut down. I guess because it was found out, even though, honestly, it just doesn't seem like anything happened in it. A person close to Sternlicht said he decided to shutter the group because the activities were moving beyond initial objectives and the people who started it, including himself, were no longer actively participating and hadn't been for months. 
That I believe. We are incredibly grateful for the dialogue and support that this group has provided over the past seven months, which was nothing. Wrote a staffer for Stern Licht. The staffer wrote that members should not hesitate to reach out if they needed anything. We are stronger together, the staffer wrote in closing. And uh, probably true. It's just, it's I don't know. And reading through this, I really thought it was going somewhere else. But honestly, it's a catalog of, like I said, Billionaire peacocking. Uh, what are we doing? What are we really, guys, what are we doing to really concretely change the views of the Gaza war? Um, we could contribute to Adams because he's helping us break up these protests. Oh, all right. Send me the info. All right. Here's the info. Okay. la dee da dee da There's nothing, you know, this didn't, didn't make me give him any money. It just, here's a link. I don't know. It's some very weak sauce. And it's not that they reporters at the post claimed it was anything else but actually to me the story is uh how guarded these guys actually are with their money even if they participate in a group where they're supposed to be pooling their resources they just don't give any it's a story uh, over and over again uh, when they are regarded as progressive donors Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrox at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Joan McCarter joins us as usual and uh, in, in in fine spirits today, so that's good news. Welcome back. Uh, let's see, we uh, it's not time for government shutdown yet, so what the not hell are we, what are we doing here? Uh, <laughs> There's, you know... Other shenanigans. Things? Okay. Yeah, yeah there's no so legislating can... happening. Uh, you've no. you made that clear. Uh, so, you know, just to catch up on things, I've been reviewing uh, headlines and such in your uh, diary feed and other things um, uh, over at Daily Coast and elsewhere, of course, and just trying to keep up with things. But right away, first thing that jumped out at me at the top of the diary feed here, Democrats are putting filibuster reform on the ballot. Okay, that we can definitely talk about. That we can definitely what, talk about. What the hell is going on here? Uh, <laughs> it's been a long, long road, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, well, for us, it certainly feels that way. Although, I guess, honestly, uh, these things usually take 20-plus uh, uh, years to get fixed. And I, Although, I guess we're approaching that. We are of time approaching spent that, that my friend. We. we are approaching that. Yeah, I didn't we really realize that. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I mean, we're really only about 5 years away from hitting the 20 year mark on on the current round of filibuster reform campaigning. So, uh right away we told everybody it's amazing to have gotten some uh progress within about 5 years. These things usually take 20 years or more and we'll never get to that point. That's crazy. Oh my gosh. Wow. I really hadn't given that any thought until just now. Oh, well, <laughs> I quit. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to leave. All right. What's happening? Why are we, I mean, what uh, what's new on this front and why is uh, Kirsten Cinema on my computer screen? What's happening? <laughs> for not the last time, because unfortunately that won't happen for a while yet. But hmm. she and Manchin are, are history. Okay. The, the good massive Fine. opposition to the filibuster reform in the Democratic Party is gone. Okay, think, certainly um, in their form. Even yeah. moderate Democrats, Mark Ke Kelly, who's hardly a firebrand, is saying, you know, this is pretty ridiculous stuff. Okay, <laughs> that the Republicans are putting us through. 
Yes. And while, you know, not everybody is saying completely nuke the filibuster, even Jeff Merkley, our chief mm-hmm. filibuster reformer for all these years, they're, he's not saying nuke it entirely. Some of the candidates are. Um, but all there right. is definitely appetite for at least some reform, potentially some carve outs mm. for things like Voting Rights Act for abortion rights. Okay. Um, maybe even for minimum wage. Who knows? Mm. You never know. Uh, those things can happen. They did. They did manage it once or twice. Um, yeah, it is odd that. Uh, uh, well, I mean, Mansion. He's just kind of a reactionary guy. Kirsten Cinema has always been just a puzzle. But okay, they're on their way out. They were the last people um, to be. Uh, let's say I don't know. I guess you describe them as sort of baselessly attached to the filibuster. <laughs> None of the things that they said the filibuster was good for has it ever actually done. So I don't know what to say, but I guess I'm glad they're moving on. And, and this is the, this is the effect, I guess, of a 20 year ongoing campaign is that, you know, every two years, a different class of senatorial candidates have got to address it as an issue. And, if you go through 10 such cycles, <laughs> you will eventually uh, find yourself with a dem- – if, if it's sustained pressure, you'll eventually find yourself with a, a Democratic caucus that is open to reform because many of them have been elected in the atmosphere in which reform is demanded. Uh, right. You know, okay. So – and if you have and to – I think out- you're, you're also looking at a bunch of candidates – for Democratic seats, vacant Democratic seats, and Mm -hmm. and in the case of Rick Scott, Ted Cruz, Republican challengers, who Mm -hmm. have experience in the Democratic House when it was under Nancy Ah. Pelosi. Okay. And they did a ton of big stuff only to watch it die in the Senate. Ah, right. Okay. That makes some sense, too. So there's just a whole new level of thinking about what the filibuster is, what Mm. it's done. I think with the income, the hopefully incoming class, most of them will be. We, Texas and and Florida are going to be a big haul, but it's not out of the question. Yeah. Certainly possible. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's not unthinkable to them and it's increasingly not unthinkable to lots and lots of current, so the mm. Democrats were saying, look what we could have done. Yes. Uh, and I guess also uh, another facet of it is uh, for people who have held out and said, uh, well, you know, the filibuster uh, does offer us some protection from extremist legislation. And I, I imagine for the first couple of years of the Trump administration while he was in office, People probably said, well, uh, imagine a Senate in Republican control and under a president like Trump, and uh, this will help us stop the worst abuses legislatively. And I guess now that things have become clear, like, oh, by the way, they don't actually mind doing these things with or without legislation. They they don't actually care what the law says. So you can filibuster all you want only to watch, you know, the things you thought you were protecting be torn down anyway, just extra legally. So I don't know how much protection it buys you. Uh, but when you it's, do control things, maybe you should do stuff. Ah, okay. Maybe I, you're right. I thought in that a quote from Adam Schiff was interesting. Hmm. They're not scared so much by the threat of, oh, Republicans could do it too. Yeah. What Schiff said mm-hmm. is that their policies are so reactionary, backward and unpopular that they should should they ever really be in a position to put them into effect, they'll be voted out of office in a heartbeat. That's ah. one thing. Oh yeah, okay. But the other part is looking at Republicans who are saying, "Oh, we must preserve the filibuster. We must preserve the filibuster," you know, in reaction to, to Democrats clearly leaning that way. And they're campaigning on it as well, thinking that that's going to be their control over Donald Trump. 
Hmm. They're not going to give him his nuking the filibuster because, you know, they're still operating under some apprehension that they can do anything to control him. Oh, I see. So, you know, Republicans are kind of blinking on the filibuster right now. Okay. And, you know, you've got Adam Schiff saying, look, you know, they know some of these things are really, really ridiculous. So do we really, it, is this a valid threat? Hmm. Yeah, that we would lose all, all power if Republicans nuke the filibuster too, you know, or if we nuke it when we're in control and then Republicans inherit it. Mm-hmm. He's pointing at them, saying, you know, are they really going to go down this insane route? And he's betting no. Yeah, well, or at least if they do, you know, will we be able to capitalize on that? They do occasionally yeah. do things that are. Uh, are horribly unpopular and very damaging, and then then they end up paying an electoral price for it. Like I don't know, overturning Roe versus Wade, which wasn't oh, a Senate yes. action, but yeah. Uh, and and I should point out that that is you know is one of the major things that's behind the thinking of a lot of these candidates and mm-hmm. current senators. Yeah. That securing abortion rights mm. is key, and if that means carving out an abortion exception in the filibuster, then they'd better do it. Yeah. All right. Well, this is, uh, is it, it's, it's interesting. And, and I guess as it turns out is, is a long time coming after all, it just doesn't, it doesn't feel like that sometimes when you think back, I it can't possibly have been that long because I did some of this and I'm not old. Oh well, yeah. I, am. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that that really is something. And, uh, but yeah, that's a that's the value of a sustained campaign. Uh, you change certain minds of the people who are currently in service. You make it an issue for class after class after class of incoming uh, candidates, whether they make it there or not. And then, of course, uh, there are some diehard holdouts. But I mean, you know, they're only going to serve a certain amount of time. Eventually, they're you know they they age out they yeah retire whatever it is or you make it clear that it's impossible for them to win again that's a possibility too but yeah i mean it's not a very satisfying thing. you can't tell activists well what we'll do is we'll wait 20 years until <laughs> we'll the, wait the, yeah <laughs> the course of their careers have have come and gone and well, okay but uh, but but the, but the point, the point is... of the activism <laughs> is that what, you know, 20 years ago was yes. a radical idea is now right. mainstream. That's true. The Democratic Party. And we do constantly complain as progressives, oh, but the Republicans are so good at this. They shift the Overton window all the time. And over the course of 20 years, their radical ideas have become mainstream. We should do the same. And then, okay, well, right, what if we did do the same? Yeah, well... Uh, I don't know. It's not the same as the, theirs is much more powerful and, and meaningful and impactful. <laughs> well, theirs is much more scary. I mean, yes, that's all. Compare, it is. you know, overturning Roe versus Wade to filibuster reform, yeah. and and just on the face of it, they don't seem to have equal weight. Right, I understand. The one is very frightening and immediate and personal, and the other is it's more abstract. But there's, you know, behind that was always, but there are things that we can do about it with it that are personal and direct and good and scary to the other guys for the, for a change. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it's understandable why it the weight of the bad stuff that Republicans do and how crazy it's become is overwhelming at times and with good reason. Uh, but yeah, because you know, it's awful. Yeah. Yeah, you shouldn't lose sight of the the foundational import of changing the way the Senate will work forever is not a it's no small thing. And it certainly will depend on what people do with it, but you know, right from the beginning it was it was always a matter of uh this is about opening the doors for the kinds of things that we've always said, we ought to be doing this. Or we ought to be backing candidates who will say and do that. Uh, and it was, but it's impossible because of the filibuster. Okay. If that is once uh, swept out of the way or carve outs are created, whatever the path is, 
it, it, it is, it's sad and troubling that it takes so long to do it, but it has to be done in, in linear fashion. You can't just skip to the good part uh, or say, no. well, I'll wait 10 years and then we'll ask for it. And then they'll, you know, we'll just get, it has to be, you have to try and fail over and over again for 20 years in order to get around to the point where, okay, one at a time, we've replaced people who were opposed for no good reason with people who are open to the possibility of change, to people who are coming into office dedicated to the prospect, of, or at least to the to the objective of change. And, uh, okay, I guess we're nearing that point once and for all. And it's also nice to, you know, see the back of... Uh, Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin once and for all. That's <laughs> not, not the least of which, because I have the hardest time with Kirsten's, Kirsten's, Kristen's. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm going to be very yeah, glad be... not to have to write about her and double check her first name yeah. again every yeah, yeah. time I write about her. <laughs> that's a that's a nice break as well. Yeah, you're never a hundred percent sure. Uh, but, but that's trivial compared to yeah. how nice it will be not to have that yeah. person killing the minimum wage, killing environmental justice, killing abortion rights, yes, killing voting rights. Yeah. But uh, all in the name of something, something, I don't know, bipartisanship somehow, not sure how, and uh, oddly bipartisanship hasn't saved her. But in fact, has uh, condemned her to the the ash heap of history, I guess. Yeah. Eventually. Uh, all right. Well, that is well, exciting. We don't news. know what our second act will be, but oh yeah, you know, I that's true. Seriously, doubt it's going to be deeply involved in policy. Uh, She's just turned yeah. out to be kind of a frivolous person. She very much would rather do things like triathlons, and you know. Lots of people Lying. are like that. That's okay. Go ahead. Tours and that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, although she'll, you know, she'll certainly get a lobbying job. Uh, I yes. just don't know how effective she's going to be. Yeah. The right. <laughs> that, that, honestly. Yeah. Right. Oh, sorry. Uh, we can't do that thing you wanted because of the filibuster. We should just tell her yeah. that and she'll say, but I thought you got rid of it. Oh, what? Well, <laughs> did we? I was thinking more along the lines of, how little respect she likely has some of her former colleagues seem to be former colleagues yeah i don't know i don't know what they what they i mean there's no there's not very many democrats in the in the democratic caucus rather who would would be interested i guess in meeting with her maybe a few that would say oh yeah yeah i remember you (laughs) come on over for lunch uh (laughs) you know maybe there are more republicans who would be interested in talking to her, but you know, they have their orders and they know where they get them. And it's not, not from her. We don't know where they're going to be getting their orders from, which is kind of interesting. Oh, inside the, of their conference. I assumed that it was always coming from, from Trump world, but I guess there's the possibility that at some point, if, if he's defeated again, uh, I, I guess they could say, well, we don't really need to, do we still need to worry about this guy? Although it's defied all the odds up to now. Why are they still interested? He's never, he's never, never won an election outright. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know what you're talking about. Because of his violent yeah. backers? I don't know. I don't Maybe. know what hold he has. It's not sure. Hmm. Anyway, I wanted to add one other thing. Since yes, we please. were talking about things that 20 years in the making. Oh, Once again, we have net neutrality. Oh, we, we didn't okay. really celebrate that when it happened a couple of weeks ago, but the FCC no. did it again. They finally got their full complement of commissioners, and we have net neutrality again. Right. Yeah, that's okay. another thing that yeah. you know we might need the filibuster gone for is actually putting that in statute, hmm. as it would be kind of good to codify. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's a branch of government that's supposed to make that their job, codifying things. We could get to that, and uh, that would be helpful uh, to have settled. Well, you know, insofar as anything can be settled anymore, settled once and for all, codified. Uh, but yeah, it feels like we've gone back and forth over this a hundred times because we have, and we've had to fight lobbying campaigns and 
uh, re, you know, redo these things as uh, the administration has changed hands. Uh, that should be a lesson that we can't really, you know, for, for all the uh, uh, fright people have. I mean, it's always been one of the scare tactics against filibuster reforms. We can't keep going just flip-flopping back and forth whenever control of Congress changes that we change our, our laws, except that was kind of actually the original idea. And uh, that didn't frighten any of the founders. And, and two, it's happening now anyway, and it's happening in a way that's uh, not particularly orderly or fact-based. So at least you could do it in debate in Congress. It wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. No, so. it wouldn't. But uh, which Jeff Merkley has been arguing for all of these years, yeah. just, you know, make people debate. Talk. Yes. All right. Talk. Refine your your objectives. So anyway, another another victory. Good. All right. We'll take for, it for this cycle. Anyway, yeah, right, this 20 year new news cycle <laughs> we've managed to get. And I guess now that I'm thinking about it, I gain, uh, you know, it hadn't really occurred to me, but I mean, uh, I mean, Jeff Merkley has been around for all, for all this time, too, and there's no sign of his stopping at any point. But, you know, eventually let's let's a- accomplish these things while some of the biggest reformers are still here and, yes. <laughs> and, and, and reward their career of hard work on these things if we if we can. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Sure. I think so. Good way to, it's, you know. I, maybe I'm mellowing. Maybe it's because I'm old now and after <laughs> 20 years of this. But you really do see the value of just hammering and hammering and hammering, which is one of the reasons why we do things like run good Democrats against somebody like Ted Cruz. Mm-hmm. It's why we do things like talk about reforming the Supreme Court, even oh, though yes. right now it looks undoable particularly when you have dick durbin True. saying oh. oh well i don't think having hearings about alito flying a flag upside down is going to really accomplish anything so let's not bother <laughs> hmm. yeah you keep uh, hammering and great. eventually you wear them down yeah uh well uh i i would like to see i would like to see a reversal on that that is unusual uh well not unusual i mean it's, it's part of the course for him it's just it's amazing that we have to keep pushing on things like this, that uh, that there are senators who who are in control of this, uh, or at least the process of, of uh, opening hearings on these things that, that just, I guess, is it really the case that he just doesn't see, does he think that the hearings won't lead anywhere or that it's not? unusual enough for well this you to be know the we're not going to be able to impeach him so why bother I, was the gist of the quote yeah i mean i understand the sentiment but i mean <laughs> like yeah. I, yeah but that i guess it's no better than what we, i was reading yesterday when we were reading about uh, the weird um judgment on the situation from steve gillers who's not a you know, not like a staunch conservative or anything. He was just the the uh, uh, NYU legal ethics expert who had said, well, uh, it's unlikely uh, at the very least that Alita would have allowed this to happen, given that he knows it would be a flagrant violation of judicial <laughs> ethics. But it's like, but that's <laughs> that's the thing is yeah i mean we hope that he wouldn't be flagrantly in violation of judicial ethics but if he was we would need to say something about it because that would be you know it's why not go on the record and say this is bad well he's yes. unlikely to change this his mind bad. i and know this needs to be talked to <laughs> yeah talked about in front of the american people i mean you know it's yeah. it's where where's the Leonard Leo subpoena, for example? Mm. What? Okay, yeah. they finally in February after after authorizing it back in November, they finally tried to do it. I think in April, and and Leo thumbed his nose. I'm saying no, no wait. So are they just dropping that? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Have 
these hearings, put it in front of the American people and talk about what's happened to our Supreme Court. Mm. So, yeah, I guess we could call uh, Dick Durbin and say, uh, I understand that you probably think you're not going to be able to impeach him. But we were just having this conversation, by the way, about how you just keep trying anyway. And then uh, over the course of 20 years, maybe something could happen or you could change uh, the views on whether or not you can dislodge this person from office. So we found it to be extremely uh <laughs> <laughs> enlightening to well, and, remind people. You know, the about thing that. about impeaching, even though it has to originate yes in the House, yeah. you make the case. Sure. And you then start point out that building the case. And this is what the Senate could be doing right now. Mm-hmm. And instead, Durbin's saying, well, yeah, maybe we need to make an agreement with Republicans on blue sips for district court judges judges or uh, rather for for appeals courts judges no yeah i get there there is something to the idea that well okay look there's a limited amount of time that we've got and there is a bit of an emergency and we should be filling judicial slots as quickly as possible given that there's an election coming up which risks control of this process uh and having a hearing on how bad alito is that isn't going to lead to anything being done about it is a is perhaps not a great use of time. But then I, I suppose if you were to deliver on those judicial appointments, well, then right. I guess that would be helpful. You know, for example, mm-hmm. as it stands now, the blue slips are yes. ignored for appeals court judges, but applied to district court judges. Hmm. And there are three longstanding vacancies, two longstanding vacancies and one coming up in Missouri where Josh Hawley and and Eric Schmidt are refusing <laughs> to hmm. play along where they're refusing well, you know? to agree to any district court judges. So this is yes. happening right now, right in front of you, Dick Durbin. Yeah. Republicans are doing their thing. And you're talking about how perhaps you make an agreement with them on blue slips going into the next cycle or the next next mm, Congress rather. Big. Wow. Um yeah, I don't know why why the agreement. I suppose well, it's true that you're not going they're not going to make any progress on impeaching or removing Alito. But by the same token, they're not going to be able to make any progress on expelling you, so why don't you just throw the blue slips out and say forget about it. We're having these hearings regardless. They're not going to be able to remove you as, you know, as chair, so go. It is just astonishing to me that he has sat through this particular class of mm. Republicans on the Judiciary Committee. Yeah. <laughs> because really they are the worst people in the Senate, mm. with the exception of Rick Scott. He's not in that committee. But, you know, <laughs> He's still one of the worst people. He's just not on the committee. Yes. Got it. Some of the very, very worst people in the Republican conference of the Senate are on the Judiciary Committee and still yeah. and everything f- that he has been through with them. Dick Durbin is extending the hand of comedy. He's saying, can't we all just get along? Well, uh, so this is where I have to tell myself patience. Mm, Yes. Patience. Right. (laughs) I guess that's true. That's the lesson we can do. It was a good uh, discussion up at the, up at the front and it was all, uh, we very, uh, very nice patting ourselves on the back a little bit for <laughs> the persistence at the very least. And now here, yeah, I guess the takeaway is, okay, don't forget that uh, yep. these things can take a long time. And sometimes there are people who stand in your way that are otherwise, you know, good people at heart and have the right principles, uh, but aren't quite as forceful as you need them to be. And then eventually they're not there anymore and you have someone else and that person should be selected from, uh, from among candidates who are reacting to an atmosphere that uh, we help create that is strongly in favor of let's not do things the way your predecessor did them necessarily. Let's yeah. try something different. And apropos to that, he's got Sheldon Whitehouse sort of nipping at his heels. Ah. Most of the things he's done that have been strong, it looks to me like, Hmm. are because Sheldon Whitehouse has been saying, you know, you know, 
Mm. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Yeah. Well, that's so, uh, that needs to be part of the strategy too. Uh, and it always kind of was, even at the beginning of the filibuster campaign, the idea of the inside outside strategy. Look, uh, Dick Durbin is hard to move, but the people who move him are people who are colleagues and he views differently than he views the rest of us squawking at him. And if it takes Sheldon Whitehouse to move him, then you start working on Sheldon Whitehouse and he's open mm-hmm. to working with you. So interesting. Okay. I'm I'm glad to hear that uh, <laughs> he, he is paying attention to what's going on <laughs> around him. He's not completely <laughs> tuned out. All right. So uh, it's still a while before we'll have to talk about government shutdown so we can leave that off the table for and, now. But I just warn you that's I'm real. going to be having construction yeah. in my house for the next two weeks. Oh, okay. So I will not be joining you on Tuesdays for the next two weeks as my bathroom is <laughs> beaten up. Okay. All right. <laughs> resurrected. Sure. Well, we look forward to the results. You'll have to tell us all about it in the end and how it went. Uh, but yeah, you know that can that can get in the way of things for sure. Uh, yes. All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll just check in with you via Daily Coast on the front page and social media where we can chat with you and you can send us a note or two if something outrageous has happened and you think we've missed it. But all right, we'll see you on the other end of it. And uh, right. the government still will not have shut down by that point. We still have plenty of time. No. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Joan. Thanks for coming in today and uh, yeah we'll check in with you in about uh, well i guess about three weeks it's like a whole summer about vacation three weeks. all yeah. right at the end of which there'll be a new bathroom and everything yeah. great Yay. okay <laughs> well take care and uh, we'll speak to you then and i'm sure we'll be in touch about uh, various issues in between now and then all so, right so we'll check in with you then and now time for us to hand things over to justice who's not having any work done at his house as far as i know but if he is he will edit it out of his podcast for your listening pleasure the west coast cookbook and speakeasy comes up next From right here Networks on netrootsradio.com see netrootsradio.com you have been listening to k in the morning with david waldman so what's up on today's show for justice Putnam? well let's see crybaby trump is at a major meltdown did you know that? As he exited his criminal trial after his sole witness fell apart on the stand. That is a different view of things. And then, of course, the usual collection of interesting and otherwise missed stories from around the country and around the world. Next, do stay tuned.